Hi everyone, welcome to Me Machine Talks, back for another wonderful episode and this time I have a very special guest, someone who means a lot to me and I'll explain why in a moment, but to explain a little bit more about Rob, I've done a short introduction which I'll roll into now. Working on titles such as Dirty Harry and Technocop, Rob Anderson has cemented himself in co-creating the game Moonstone as well as other notable mentions, including Fiendish Freddy's Big Top of Fun, which I've streamed once, and it was um, interesting. Uh, The Incredible Crash Dummies, uh, and modern games, including uh, Iron Man 2. Rob's career has spanned over two decades, so let's learn a little bit more about the man who has created one of the best-known cult classics on the Amiga. Rob Anderson, welcome to Me Machine Talks. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. That's very little little memory lane there. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's what I like to do is is go right through the history and uh, try to do as much research on my guests as possible. So, uh, I mean, yeah, just just from that list, there are some quite uh, impressive uh, games in that list. Um, F- Fiendish Freddy's uh, Big Top of Fun came up on a stream once that I did. Um, I'd recently got my uh, I recently obtained an Amiga A six hundred from a friend of mine. Um, um and uh and yeah it was it was all great and everything was fine and then uh, i started to do a stream i had a um compact flash card inserted and had loads of games and someone said oh playing fiendish freddies and i was going i've never heard of that and then yeah that was an interesting stream <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh that was like one of my uh last sort of really favorite uh games that i animated on um when I worked with gray matter that, that was like, we were all inspired by Looney tunes and just like really sort of squash squish, you know, type of stretch type of animation systems and stuff. So we were going all in on, on that whole thing. So that, that was a lot of fun to do. <laughs> good, good. Um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, what I'd like to actually do first, and I've done this with a few other guests is, uh, is actually pass the torch over to you um, to talk about any of your social medias or any, projects or anything else that you've got going on or where people can find out more about yourself oh sure uh i'm not really much of a what when i say when you say social media i'm not really that engaged in social media but i do have my twitter account that uh, i saw that you um have have, uh followed so that's that's wonderful um and i got a small website that's more of a portfolio for job search and stuff it's not that exciting but I usually go by the handle of Mr. Trog, being Trogs are the uh, sort of like the first character that I animated for Moonstone. So it's kind of like the the one character that's in all the encounter areas. So I sort of like, I don't know, adopted that character character's name. Um, and it's usually Mr. because Trog is usually taken as far as handles. I, I don't, I'm not <laughs> sure what, what other people refer to a Trog as. But for me, it's kind of like, yeah, that's the one character that I remember doing. So, uh, as far as, uh, uh, other works and stuff, uh, I have, I, I, I'm sort of doing, um, a couple different things. Uh, I work with a company called, uh, CSUN games and, uh, I'm doing actually, um, animation tools and pipelines and stuff. So not really design and stuff, but, um, still something that I, sort of flip-flop in between all the time, which is animation systems. I do enjoy writing those tools. Moonstone, for example, was uh, a buildup of several tools that I had made, and that's what enabled me to do the animation I did in that game. So it's kind of something that I, I, I thoroughly enjoy kind of engaging in. And um, I've done, uh, yeah, a on hobby stuff, I'm really trying to, like, I, I've been primarily a coder for most of my past, uh, like, 10 years or more. So I've been trying more to get back to my roots of animation again and stuff. So and I have to admit, I'm having a great time just u- learning and using all these new open source tools or just even purchased ones or whatever. There's just, like, from the old D-Paint games, which I love D-Paint. That was, like, my go-to tool but uh some of the new stuff out there today uh that's free and stuff is just a blast to go through so that's sort of a quick summary of of sort of what i'm I'm engaged in um i am working on slowly like reinventing moonstone for the 
the new uh, generation of uh, hardware and stuff. I, I uh, you know, I, I've definitely received lots of information. Um, when you talk about social media, actually, Rob Taylor, I'm not sure if you know him, uh, but he, he runs the Moonstone Tavern website and uh, has been like my biggest advocate to promote Moonstone to the world and say, hey, this is a great game and stuff. So I'm going to give a big shout out to Rob for that. So I've chatted with him a couple times and uh, he certainly has thrown me lots of um, kudos and information and saying, hey, you should check out this. Like people have been sending me fan art and and I think that's a big flattery thing for me, like to have somebody like take something I did like many years ago and say, hey, you know, I really liked your game and I drew this and it's based on your character. And I, I'm like, wow, you you have gone way above what, <laughs> what I've done. And that is excellent work. So and I try and uh, send out, uh, you know, praise and thanks and stuff to people. Um, that's generally what I use my uh, Twitter account for is just more or less to see what's out there in the game world of uh, art and stuff. And just like some of the stuff people are doing is just amazing. So it's, it's funny you mentioned deluxe paint because uh, I've interviewed um, Stu Cambridge from uh, sensible software uh, makers of cannon fodder and, and games as such and sensible soccer. And it's so funny because listening to his opinion mm -hmm. of, modern versus old he still likes to go to the old because it's it's part of his his workflow and everything but you could you could hear that he was trying to move away from using the old tech that he's got but i guess when you've been so ingrained with it and he had so much success it's very hard to make that transition and i guess that's probably where um some of the issues may lie where obviously if you are trying to migrate moonstone in its form from one platform to another as you migrate over obviously things like sprite and sizing and things like that obviously start to take a bit of a hit and um obviously trying to transfer one for one from an old tech to a new tech can lead to a lot of uh, a lot of problems a, a very recent example would be the um I don't know if you've heard about the Blade Runner game, uh, which is the point and click adventure game. Um mm. it was recent it was recently well, I don't want to say remastered because I don't think that's correct. I would, I would say renewed. Um, and part of the problem was is a lot of the original assets were actually lost. So they were trying to take something that looks pretty rubbish <laughs> and give it a HD boost. So for things like <laughs> FMVs, you can use modern technology to boost from you know what would be deemed low quality video to 4K and do a relatively good job. But the original assets, y you really struggle. And um, you know, I, I think it was a a sad turn of events because unfortunately it got absolutely slated in the press. I absolutely love the game. I think it's fantastic. Um, but it was a real shame that I think the wording was incorrect. I don't think it should have been called remastered or at least that was what they were portraying it to be. And the end result wasn't that. And that's why I said sometimes by taking the old and trying to give it a, a new lease of life can really have an issue where if you don't get it right, you're going to get absolutely slaughtered in the press. Um, yeah, even yeah. though the game, the game is fantastic. If no one's played the point and click adventure Blade Runner, please do. It's one of the finest point and click adventures ever made, in my opinion. Um, right. probably, se probably second to Monkey Island too. Um, but yeah, it just shows that sometimes if you try to make that transition and you don't get it right, you will get hit hard for it. Um, that is my biggest fear, actually. Yeah. I call it the George exactly. Lucas effect because yes. uh, remember he did this the prequels and everyone started slamming them and saying, stop ruining this for us. And I'm like, that's the last thing I want to hear. So, uh, per Perfect example. Perfect, perfect example. And, you know, the, the Blade Runner community are, well, incredibly divided, regardless regardless of the game alone. I mean, the films divide people's opinion in the Blade Runner community. So to take something that's the only game that's kind of officially made, that's Blade Runner branded, and to, well, I, I think I think the upgrade that they have done is, is passable. I think a lot of people were expecting, you know, full fireworks and full fanfare, and what they got was a little bit disheartening. But to be honest, it was like £5, or I think it was like £9 mm. when it came out. I mean, it's it's still it's still not a lot for someone to take it and make it run on modern hardware. But anyway, I digress. We're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you. Um, so what I normally do is, is try and go all the way back, all the way back, all the way back in time and, and run all the way through to the modern era. So 
So what what was Little Rob's life? Where where did you grow up? What was your your childhood like in terms of getting around computing? What what was that like for you? Oh, I uh, you know I, I was always fascinated with art. Uh, the small Rob was just like uh, that was like my go to thing to do was drawing, sketching, coloring, whatever it was, and and uh, there was this point uh, being a kid of the uh, growing up in late seventy early. Uh, mid 80s and stuff we got the transition of computers and I remember the computer lab appearing in the high school that I was at and I was like well this is new like at the time it was ASCII art which is terrible but mm -hmm. fun at the same time but I, I just thought this was the neatest thing and and at that time uh, a friend of mine actually at school had an Atari 400 computer and i just love that thing and i said i'm doing whatever i can to get this computer so <laughs> i saved up my little money from my part-time job that i had and uh, bought this computer and was fully engaged after that um i would do um let's see on the atari 400 it was there wasn't really a lot of uh drawing programs and stuff so it was all done on graph paper <laughs> and then i would right. program program that into the computer so i was really down to like i'm learning everything about this piece of hardware i can um so that was my introduction to computers and after that i was just like this is what i want to do and i think it's a wonderful thing that i actually was managed to navigate my career <laughs> to follow this sort of whole thing so but at first i was really i was just really into art i was like i want to animate on this the this device and I was just fascinated with some of the games I was seeing coming out on the Atari. Uh, so I was like, uh, how do I do this? And especially with arcade games and stuff, there's a few call it shout outs that I would have to say that were like, uh, Joust was like one of my favorites. And uh, Joust actually probably would be one of the influencers for the game that Moonstone became because you could play against other people. And I always thought that was like so much fun, have a friend to play rather than the single player games and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, so that's sort of where I went. And uh, from there, I went into college and I was taking animation um, Oh, sorry. No, at, at my first year of college, believe it or not, was, uh, programming business systems. <laughs> <It was, laughs> Interesting. I, I was like, I want to take programming. So I said, oh, okay, well, I'll take this. And that programming classes were database accounting, stuff like that. And I was like, this is, I, I hated it. It was horrible. It was like, <laughs> I'm not surprised. The, the worst thing I thought, why, you know, it just wasn't me. I, I'm glad there are people that enjoy it. I, hats off to you guys and stuff, but, uh, no, I, it just wasn't my thing. And, um, one of my teachers actually who taught C programming was, uh, he said, you should really take the advanced course because at that time I had programmed the Atari 400 in assembly language. So I, I kind of had a, a good sense of programming. Um, so he was introduced me to that, but at that same time, my college also, which was Sheridan College, which is really popular for animation, um, it's it's in Oakville. When when you ask where where I grew up, it's Oakville, Ontario, mm. um, and there's a college in Oakville, Ontario called Sheridan College that is uh, highly sought after for the animation studios. Uh, Disney goes to recruit there and stuff. So, mm. I uh, sort of saw what they were doing, and I was like fascinated with that whole thing. So I dropped out of business computer systems <laughs> programming class and joined animation, which is like a total to the other side of the campus <laughs> the entire thing. So I started to take that and I was really enjoying that. And at that point, uh, a company called Gray Matter, who Chris Gray ran, and I knew Chris from high school, and he was one who him and his brother introduced me to the Atari. Anyways, he, he was actually starting to do video games at the time, and he was doing well with it, and, and he actually was making money off of it. And uh, what was the game he did? Infiltrator on the uh, uh, Commodore 64. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, hey, I'm, I'm making some new games. Would you be interested in doing some art? 
And so I started to actually work on an Atari ST for him part-time while going to school. But eventually it was a little overwhelming to do both. So I kind of stopped my animation career and just went full-time in with working with him. And uh, sort of that's spawned a whole uh, large amount of games. And it was all uh, in the Toronto area, uh, Oakville and stuff. So that, w- that was my humble beginnings of uh, and my introduction to uh, really doing it professionally and stuff. So um, I'm trying yeah, to it must, it must have been um, it, it must have been odd to be. I mean, I, I kind of have experienced a similar thing to yourself where you start going down this route of programming for business and and this kind of thing and and it's so far removed from where you actually end up did you here's an interesting question did you find any of what you had looked at or 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 studied in that business sector become useful for anything that you have done no (laughs) i had a feeling that was going to be the answer (laughs) no there was uh the only thing that was interesting in that biz- is they, they made you take philosophy and psychology. And I found those two classes mm. interesting for the discussions, quite uh, taxing for amount of time to read. So there was a tremendous amount of stuff to read, but those were interesting. The rest of it was all just, um, uh, let's see, what was the programming language? Uh, it was Pascal, Cobalt, and it was basically really old school business stuff that governments still use today. Yeah. And it was like, take this, these classes and stuff. And I was like, oh, I hated Cobalt. That was like the worst language. It was so formalized. It was, I, I was so used to assembly language. You take over the hardware. It's like, there's, there's no rules. There's no OS. Yeah. It's just, here's the hardware and figure it out yourself type of thing so and when yeah, you break I, it in assembly you, you break it good so i remember doing pascal and yeah i mean i i wouldn't say i'm a very competent programmer i get the foundations of it but the problem is is that i had a very strange um university um career guidance um path that's probably a better word um so i initially started a course um because a previous course that i had done i thought i had failed two of the eight modules i think it was and then part of the way through starting this course i actually got contacted by the um the education board for this particular course who said hey guess what you actually passed and uh i was like oh, well, that kind of changes everything. So as quick as I could, I left that. um, I can't remember what it is. I think it's like a business, was it a business programming and finance course, I think? Do you know what? Honestly, it was so long ago, I can't even remember. I just pushed it to the back of my mind. Um, And then I started an animation and interactive media course because, you know, that's what I was interested in. Um, So, yeah, so similar to you, I kind of like studied some of this, some of this stuff that I just had no interest in. And then suddenly (laughs) I was like, oh, I can actually do the thing I wanted to now. Yay, let's go into that. No, we've, we've kind of gone the same path there. So it's like, yeah, no, we don't want that. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the just the word Pascal sends shivers down my spine. So I can I can relate. So um, so you said you had uh, an Atari 400. At mm-hmm. what point did you then start to work on or in and around an Amiga setup? Oh, uh, that was, uh, yeah. So the 400 taught me programming and some art and stuff. And then... Um, I had seen the Amiga in the store and I remember going to the store many times and seeing the Atari, or sorry, the Amiga, what was it? The 1000 at the time, but I ended up, my first one was the Atari, uh, sorry, I keep saying Atari, Amiga 2000. (laughs) So uh, that was, that was my first one. I I said, I'm going all in. I want that one. So that was the one I, I had to save up a bit of cash for that. So uh, once I had that, I was like, all in and i was using that all the time for the art and it wasn't that long um after i started um like when i was doing that art when i was leaving college i was kind of a um a contractor at the time so i i had saved up enough money at that time to get one and uh and then when working at gray matter as well they they were using those systems as well to to do ah, okay. Lux paint. 
Ah, so, I see. So, 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 was, so, so Grey Matter was your first introduction to the, to the Commodore Amiga, and then obviously, I guess, working in a business environment for gaming. Yeah, it was the first professional, but I had had a, a, a dream of buying it myself. So I did get one for myself before Grey Matter threw one. It was the Atari ST that they were using at first. Um, right. Which didn't have the nice colors that the Amiga did. It was still kind of a limited thing, and their sound chip was, I'm trying to remember, it wasn't that great. Yeah, it's it's funny because there's a <laughs> there's another podcast called This Week in Retro, which which I highly um, encourage you to to listen to, and it's quite funny because two of the presenters are very much Amiga enthusiasts, and the other guy is an ST enthusiast, and it's quite <laughs> funny because they're constantly dropping jokes against each other, where it's like, well, our graphics are better, and it's like, where well, yeah, but your music sounds like trash, so you know, it's this yes. it's this trade off. So I, it's funny you said that because I'm not surprised. Um, they made the switch but obviously i i guess at the time from a a professional business point of view the the st was probably more of a uh less of a financial hit but obviously the end result is that you can't be i guess as much more creative and especially if you're doing animation and art you, you need those colors right so yeah, yeah. I, I can understand why they made that switch that, that's that's exactly why and i feel that the atari um group who used to be Commodore <laughs> they yes, flipped yes. And, and, but yeah, I think they sort of were like trying to be IBM. They, they were so gung ho to sort of like be the business computer. That's fun. And I was just like, no, wrong, wrong. It's Atari. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> stick to the roots. If you're going to use the Atari name, stick to your roots. Don't like try and reinvent it into Xerox or IBM mm -hmm. or something like that, which I think that's what they kind of did wrong in, in the end. But, uh, no, the Amiga with Deluxe Paint, especially Deluxe Paint 3, was like the one that they introduced the animation and everything. I was just like, oh, this is this is it. This is the one. So I was like, uh, yeah, that. And I'm trying to remember some of the other software I used. There was some morphing software, which was the first time I ever had used that. And there was this image processing and I wish I could remember the names of them. Um, but uh, New Tech created the, uh, what was it? The video toaster. That mm. thing was like uh, the first time you sort of saw video cameras and, and digitizing abilities. I, I couldn't afford that one. That was that one was too expensive for my... Just a little bit out of your, out of your cost range, just that much. <laughs> yeah, it was too... Although too actually much. it was that much. <laughs> <laughs> I was more geared towards getting the, uh, the D interlacer card so that you could have the... I, I think I programmed on the Amiga for about two years without a D interlacer. And I was, wow. so it was kind of this jiggly screen at times. But uh, luckily when I started working on Moonstone, um, Mindscape said, you know, here, just take this card <laughs> because you're killing us looking at it. Thank you. That's the perfect segue. So, so how did the the job at Moonstone come about? Was there did someone reach out to you? Was there a job in a paper? The only reason I ask is, I, again, referring back to one of my other podcasts with Stu Cambridge, it was hilarious how he got the job at, at Sensible Studios. So, uh, uh, sorry, Sensible Software. So it will be fascinating to hear your take on how you you got presented oh. this particular job. Yeah. So it, it's while I was working at Gray Matter, I took it upon myself. So to give you an idea, so some of the other background I have, as a kid, I played a lot of D&D &D with my friend hmm. Todd, who's also on the credit for uh, Moonstone, sure. and uh, a few of my other friends, and we used to play that a lot. So uh, Todd sort of came to me and says, hey, um, I have this idea for a game. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And he was more of, you know, just the strategy part, like the RPG aspect of it. He was like, uh, here's the thing. Uh, here's sort of this background where you just sort of go around, you get these keys, and and then you got to go fight this thing at the end, and, and you win them. And I was like, oh, okay. So I sort of ran with that, and I said, well, I think it would be more fun if we did, like, combat, because I was into, like, a game like Barbarian, um, which uh, it, over here was called uh, Iron Sword or something. I can't remember. It was a different name mm -hmm. here. But um, so I was really into that, and I said, oh, maybe if we hybrided this together it'd be 
kind of cool. So while I was still working at Gray Matter, at night I would go home and I would just do some of these animations and stuff. And um, and I was putting together this sort of like presentation of just this, I'm going to simulate a combat in this little movie using D-Paint. And I sort of put that together, put together a two-page design. And then um, Chris Gray, who ran Gray Matter, was good friends with all the guys at Mindscape. He had actually done lots mm. of games with Mindscape. He represented us and he said, hey, why don't uh, I introduce you to Mindscape? And being where he was with the status, he, he said, Rob's a good guy. He can he can do this. And um, and after that, it was just a quick meeting, I believe, with uh, Phil Harrison, who uh, was uh, at the time running the Mindscape studio in uh, Burgess Hill in UK. And uh, I think, who was the other one? Jeff Heath, who was who ran all of Mindscape. He, he owned it. Um, and uh, basically, we did it. Uh, it took about two weeks and it was pretty well just a short little contract and a handshake type of thing. <laughs> and they threw us a budget, which <laughs> is laughable in today's terms. <laughs> but, go, go on. How much was it? If you can say, uh, I, I Ball, think it ballpark, was ballpark shy of $40,000. <laughs> I see. So, so it wasn't really a big, uh, big risk project really for them. Mm. Well, I, I don't know, maybe back in that day, that was kind of a big deal because most games were done in seven, seven to nine months, somewhere around there. So uh, mine didn't, mine was a lot longer than that. I kept sort of like free flowing it a little too much. Um, but yeah, so th that's basically how the Moonstone sort of evolved. It was uh, all kind of done in a sort of a quick sort of way like that. And uh, and then at that point, um, I had left Grey Matter and uh, off I went and started working um, in my house. So, or my parents' house, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> interesting. So, uh, here, so here's an interesting question for you. So, and, and I probably already know the answer to this. Considering you had been exposed to the Atari interface as well as the Amiga interface, was it already set that you were immediately focused on this is going to be an Amiga release rather than any other system? Is that, Or was that down to more of the, I guess, the limitations of the others versus what you could potentially do on the Amiga? I chose the Amiga because I was really just most comfortable with it. Right. And, okay. uh, the Atari, I didn't want to have anything to do with because of the color limitations. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, There's no, many I people in my comments going, there's nothing wrong with you. Tell me, blah, 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 blah. but you go <laughs> ahead. I, I'm an Amiga fanboy, So you carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, at that time when at gray matter, for example, I, I had sort of established a solid, um, animation pipeline that I could just do my work. Right. And, um, there were some tools that I wanted to create. So, in order to do the animation that I wanted for Moonstone, I knew these tools had to be written by me or there wasn't really anyone. So I, I started to write tools at the same time. So I was kind of, I sort of had three, four jobs at the same time. I would like draw animation on paper, I'd transfer my drawings over to the Amiga, I'd render them. Uh, then I would say, oh, I got to update my animation tool so I can export it, put it into the code. And so I would, like I, I controlled all these different pieces of it. Wow. So, so, uh, so I'd basically spend about two weeks drawing and coloring. And then I would spend about another two weeks uh, doing the exporting and programming. And then I would go back, revise, and just keep circling and circling. And so I would do that for every character. And that, that was the biggest time consuming device. But you know, after you do like two characters, you, it starts to just become a rhythm. So um, it worked out quite well at the end. So, but that that's kind of how my pipeline worked. And I, I definitely had help uh, by, uh, there's a guy, uh, Kevin, Kevin Orr, that's listed on the credit. He, he was the more of the hardware, talked to the, the actual hardware, and, and he wrote, some amazing tools for me. So um, 
basically he he wrote it so you throw out the amiga os which took up 150 of your k of memory which was very valuable to me and he rewrote uh the whole os so that i could just draw sprites and access the drives and controllers and stuff and he wrote a remote debugger so i could program on my amiga 2000 and i had amiga 500 and the 500 was my slave and i could just uh debug remotely between the two systems so wow that's cool because i was just about to say because if you've taken away the os how are you gonna (laughs) test stuff you've been constantly going back and forth that's very cool because I, I guess, and I guess, in, I mean, I, I also come from a video editing background, and I've seen that done before, where you can literally have a computer with something else, where the video is being pushed through, so that you can see the final result whilst you're editing. So it sounds like you had a very, a very sophisticated setup on a very well limited budget. That's very impressive. I'm, I'm, okay, yes. I'm quite taken back at actually. I'm like, mm, okay. <laughs> well, it was uh, a lot of. Uh effort. And, and I, I will say that uh, several of the people that I work with are extremely talented and they cut me a little bit of leeway for my budget. It's just good. I had worked <laughs> with Kevin before. Kevin Kevin did Technocop that, that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And um, some of the artwork and stuff done by Dennis Turner was also Fiendish Freddy, Technocop. Well, Dennis was our resident expert animator. So, and uh, if you look up Dennis, you'll see Dennis has gone on to do many great things. He worked with ILM, did lots of Star uh, Star Wars and Star Trek. And I think now he actually is uh, head of art in Sheridan College, actually. So wow. he's like the head of the art department, inspiring young new minds how to, <laughs> how to move forward with stuff. But Dennis is, is like uh, super talented. So that's that's very cool. Okay, so you mentioned animation, and one thing that is probably most impressive about Moonstone is, um, well, the death animations. Because when I played it, I died a lot, which you were expecting me to say anyway. So, <laughs> how do how do I ask this question? Um, where did the idea for a lot of the, I guess, more gruesome death animations in the game come from? Is that through <laughs> research? Is that just your your own mind that's coming up with these? Was there like a film that you watched that you got some inspiration <laughs> from? Where, where did that Where did that come from? Because some of them are just brilliant and as simple as that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, let's see. So uh, definitely um, the Black Knight from the Holy Grail, Monty Python, the Holy Grail. <laughs> That, that battle scene where he's cutting off the arms and everything, and I, I just love him, the blood squirts and stuff. So that, that was definitely an inspiration. Um, some of it was just childhood readings of uh, Vlad the Impaler type of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, the spear where the, the trog spears you and then yep. and then you just <laughs> slide down. Yes, yes, I do. I've seen that animation Quite a few times. Thanks. Thanks for the memories. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of it was just me just sort of like taking the elements of what the attack was. And one of the uh, things that I did with design was I wanted to make it as much fun to die as it was to to win. <laughs> so, so that you would kind of enjoy it. And I think maybe I got a little bit of that from uh, this game called Battle Chess on the Amiga where you took pieces and it was just so much fun to see how the piece destroys the other piece and stuff. Sure. And I thought that that is a cool concept. It's just like you just almost want to try all the different combinations of things to, to make it happen. So I, I really worked hard at sort of like coming up with different ways to kill the knight in some fashion. Um, and a, a little bit of horror movie elements, definitely with the mud guys of the, the mm. wetlands, uh, with the little organ sounds. And thanks to Richard Joseph for that. I said, I want a scare sound and maybe, you know, throw in sort of like the 30s, 40s movies, like a Hitchcocky type of thing where it's just like the, the sound is more terrifying than the actual act or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of that stuff sort of came out of my imagination. I'll, I'll, I'll tribute D&D, playing D&D with my friends. And we would often sort of go into graphic detail of how we would kill each other. or <laughs> How the monster, like when you're Dungeon Master, you're describing maybe how you're destroying the other character or something in graphic detail and stuff. So, no, sure. I can, I can appreciate that. I mean, I've seen... 
uh well i've seen a lot of the uh the death scenes that's to say the least and um yeah it's uh it's it's quite a gruesome game for those who haven't played it but it is it's definitely a game that i think most people should go and play especially if you own an amiga um and i guess that kind of comes onto something else which is the i guess that the how can i describe this for me i i well i mean i was i was very young when i was playing the game probably too young to be playing it at the time but um i always thought it was a very successful game and i guess one of the things and through doing research is it, it never really made it too far around the world did it no. I, I, I i always wondered and this was pre, you know, Mortal Kombat days with the, you know, the the, um, the the courts in America slamming down on violence and all of this crazy stuff. Do you think that the violence actually hindered the game being bigger than what it could have been or what it became? Uh, I don't think it would have been a game without the violence. I, I think it's complementary to, to what the game is. Like, I remember Mindscape asking me about the blood. They were squeamish of it. Right. And that, that's actually why they, it used to be just called Moonstone, but it was Mindscape that said we should add a hard day's night because they thought it was a nice pun that would lighten the mood. I never really was a big fan of that, but they thought it would really help. And I was like, okay, you know, being, being <laughs> sort of like my first game, I'm like not going to be too debating with them over, over the name, but I like the simplicity of just Moonstone. But anyway, um, so we put in the gore switch to sort of appease them too. And I, I don't know if anyone ever played the game. That could be a good poll. Who played the mm. game without the gore? Yeah, you I know. might try that one on Twitter actually and see. <laughs> <laughs> I would be curious to know if anyone really did that because um, anyways, that took a lot of filtering for me to now filter all the gore out of this for that one switch yeah and stuff uh but you still so i i'm trying to remember what i did I, I think i turned off the beheadings which i thought were so much fun <laughs> but i agree i agree uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah i i don't think it it would have been a good game otherwise it would have just been a typical rpg game you know not really much much else to it it should hmm. just be a board game at that point more or less Sure. It didn't have the gore. Like, I think the combat was what sort of set it apart from other RPGs or like D&Ds and stuff like that. Hmm. No, but, I agree. Yeah, the, the whole thing with uh, the, yeah, the, it was a pre-Mortal Kombat game and sort of Mortal Kombat sort of opened the doors for a lot of gore, I think, in, in and and I did like the game Mortal Kombat. I am not a very good Twitch player, which is the <laughs> button combo. So I was terrible. But I used to like to watch people playing it in the arcade. You know, it, it used to be the arcade game that people would gather around and of watch a really good person play it. So you sort of see it for what it is. Um, so that game actually, with its popularity, made Nintendo and Sega change their thinking a little bit and bend the rules but mm -hmm. moonstone was presented to both nintendo and sega mm -hmm. and they both really did like it but they said it's too violent for our audiences at this time so that's why it never reached north america north america said if we don't get nintendo or sega then there's no point in us putting a marketing budget behind this product wow so that was the unfortunate thing with Moonstone. So it never reached North American shores. So it was primarily a European game. Mm. And uh, Britain was probably the most popular. And and I'm not so, yeah. <laughs> and, Coach Barra uh, here. <laughs> and Germany um, is notorious for banning violent games. So uh, it did get hit that mark. However, <laughs> the joke, of, I, I just think it's funny because when you ban something, it tends to, attract more interest so and uh, exactly. germany was notorious for its pirate pirating abilities and uh yeah i think it was a german board that had it had the game up on their pirate boards in like shy of two weeks something like that <laughs> in, in the release and i was like well there it is so <laughs> congratulations guys you've played yourself well done <laughs> yes so i was like well there it is thanks guys but <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I, I think you touched on, on something interesting, actually, and it would be interesting to get your your view on it. Um, Xcopy was always owned by a lot of different people who had Amigas, and I know you know what Xcopy is. Mm-hmm. As As someone who has spent hit well hit most of his life making games and you know you've obviously made moonstone to see your own game being pirated what what's the internal fight that you have because obviously people are enjoying your game but you're not getting the monetary reward do do you have like this internal conflict with those two things (laughs) it'd be interesting to get your view on it um yeah it's it's discouraging because I'll say Moonstone was not a financial success for me. It didn't have a large development budget and the sales were flat, which is why there was never a sequel um, because they talked about it and I, I designed it and they just said, uh-huh. well, the sales weren't there. So it was right. kind of a curse for me because of that. Um, so do I blame the pirates? No, not really. Because a lot of the people that use pirate boards generally don't buy games anyways. So, yeah. And I'm not sure if that, the point is that they don't buy them because they don't want to, uh, they wouldn't do it because they have no money. I think it's, yeah, I do have the money. Some people just do it because it's, cause they can, more or less. But for me, it's a, a duality of, yeah, I get it. I, I don't think there's any way around it at this point in in the world of software. There'll always be someone that'll pirate stuff. Uh, hopefully, the companies that publish the games have an incentive to sort of try and market it so that people do buy it in some mm. sense of the word. So I, I think it's a symbiotic relationship with, uh, with the developer and the, the, the publisher to sort of say, Hey, publisher, it's up to you to sort of like deal with that aspect and help the sales and stuff. Um, but I've certainly met a few people in my day that I, I did not agree with where they just said a game is only worth the price of the disc it's on. And I was like, ouch, <laughs> you have obviously not worked over two years on a project and put in a lot of time of your uh, to do something to think that it's only worth a dollar or something like that, like the price of the disc. So I, I found that a little offensive, but... Um, no, I, I, I agree there. I think, well, yes, no, I do agree with that statement. And um, you can't quite compare the two, but uh, a friend of the channel, um, Retro Ravi from uh, the Retro Hour, um, he, uh, I think he co-helps make a uh, a recent or a modern um, Amiga magazine. And it's funny because he actually put on Twitter the other day, or I think it might have been on Facebook, um, I can't believe people are taking my magazine and pirating it and basically making digital copy, uh, taking the digital version and uploading it for others to enjoy. And I'm thinking, Christ, this is a magazine, you know? Like, I mean, it isn't like bank breaking, you know? So it, it, as you said, it, it, any medium where someone can, I guess, get it for free will be taken advantage of. I guess the the thing that I've seen recently that I've seen a lot of indie developers do is sell their software with whatever price they want. So they will literally have a website with an empty shopping cart. You pay what you think. And it's like, I can get why you do that. Um, I guess if it's a single person who's worked on that project, then, you know, any money that comes in is great. But, but for instance, in Moonstone's case, you had a budget, you had a company behind you, there's multiple people. And as you said, you've invented things for this passion project and for it to be, pirated i i could understand you being incredibly hurt by that because obviously you've put an incredibly amount of time if you know you, you had spent a couple of months and you said eh, you know it's a game i've put out there cool yeah. whatever no biggie then that's fine but as you said i think when you come down to a, a a labor of love that's then taken advantage of because basically someone couldn't be bothered to go and buy it yeah you know, like, it's, it's disheartening yeah it's it's like i i did two years to develop Moonstone. So that, that's a significant amount of time. But mm. on, on the subject, though, it, it, I, I do think that today's world has this incredible new way of doing things for finances. Like, I would certainly be discouraged if I went out and bought a game, like back in the day, and I hated it. And I spent like $30. I think it was $30 back back then. And you can't get a refund or anything. And it, I, I can sort of see a point. 
in today's world with the e-commerce and stuff, there is new ways to sort of like say, here's a tryout game. And if mm-hmm. you like it, you can tip me, like you said, you know, oh, pay what you want. And yeah. there are people that are more sport like with Kickstarters and stuff and, and uh, you know, certain websites are like Patreon and stuff that you mm. can just tip the developer and say, Hey, I really liked your game. I, you know, something. And so th- there's all, all these new avenues to basically sort of get around those old arguments of, um, you know, where the, the store says it's sold, no refunds and stuff. And it's like, but I hate this game. It sucks. It's got <laughs> bugs or, you know, that that's the worst thing is if you buy a game and it's got bugs and, and Moonstone did have a bad bug in it when it first got. Oh, really? Oh, yes. now this is something I wasn't aware of. Do tell. Oh, well, okay. I'll give you a bit of backstory. So basically Moonstone, I think, had two days of testing before it went to press, like print. Wow. Okay. And the guys were working overnight, but uh, like to try and solve. But there was this one bug that if you went to the... Um, and I hated this bug, and I cringe now thinking about it because it's a stupid mistake on my part. But, <laughs> but anyways, what would happen is you would go to the UI where you could uh, collect or steal um, items on the inventory, and mm-hmm. the dagger wouldn't move anymore. It would just be frozen. Oh. And so you basically the game's dead at that point because you can't exit. There was no right. key. There was no yes, shortcut that's right. to say exit. And I fixed that, I think, a week after the press. And then uh, they they updated the, the releases of stuff. So they would swap out the disc for you. But I oh, think yeah. one of the pirate boards, to, to <laughs> and I laugh now, but at the same time, I was offended. But uh, uh, one of the pirate guys says, Moonstone pirated with bug fixed. And I was wow. like, wow, how did you <laughs> fix it? So... <laughs> You didn't even have the code. He'd obviously just, you know, just taken, taken the other version of, yeah. figured out where it was and then fixed it. So anyway, wow, so that's an admission. Piracy. <laughs> it's not always bad. <laughs> no, no. In that case, I'm like, oh, man, you should be writing games if you can do that type of stuff. Exactly. So. But, you well, know, maybe- these. The- these things happen. I've seen it with modern gaming where they test and test and test and they put hours of tests and international versions and people all around the world and then it comes out and there's that one guy who will just take that one route that you've never tested and then all of a sudden the whole game is broken. <laughs> You're like, how do we not spot it? We've got a million dollar budget on testing. How do we not get it? It's like, well, this one guy did it, so on you. But you know what? I think that adds... It adds a bit of honesty to it because I think a lot of, I guess, indie devs would probably try and stay away from mentioning that. So I appreciate you talking about that because <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. Fortunately, I'd never experienced that bug. So uh, I guess I've got away with one. Um, as you mentioned releases, have you seen how much boxed copies of Moonstone go for on eBay? I have seen that they go for a lot of money. <laughs> yes, I was about to say that. Eye-watering amounts because... I, I, it was funny because I hadn't looked for a while and I told a few of my community that you're going to be on the podcast and they were very excited. So um, I can't wait for them to listen to this. And then they said, can you ask Rob to make new versions to bring the copies of, of Moonstone down on eBay? And I went, is it that bad? And they went, can I have a look? And I was like, oh, oh, yeah. yes, it is quite a lot, isn't it? Oh, so the last one I saw, I've seen one. Well, I've seen one listed for 500. I've seen another one that is apparently sealed. I don't know how much truth is in that for about 800 pounds, which is wow, eye watering. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I I don't think I'll be getting a copy again anytime soon, which does hurt a little bit. But um, but anyway, that brings us on to something else because you mentioned you're trying to renew Moonstone from the modern era. Yes. So how how far are we in that production, and when are we going to see it? Because now you've got uh, my you've got my interest level like up here at the moment. So. I don't really have a date specified, and and actually where I'm at is sort of uh, I've done some demos uh, with some of the new uh, modern engines to um, create things. But so to start off, I have my big box of original artwork that I used for Moonstone and it's all hand-drawn, okay. 
hand drawn. So I've scanned most of those original drawings into the computer. So, so it's a tribute to the existing design, but I don't want it just to be a reskin. But I, I it's hard to, hard to sort of describe because um, I'm still trying to develop a look and feel that makes me happy. Sure. And that's why uh, I've probably frustrated some people wondering, where is it? Where is it? Where's the demo and stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I still don't like the way I'm drawing. Like I'm, I'm rusty compared to when I did the original. <laughs> so I'm still trying to establish my, uh, my flow again. Um, luckily, I can still draw the night. So it's just one of those characters that I drew so many times that it's like, it's like a reflex for me, but, um, <laughs> but um, so it's, it's a tribute to the original. I'm not changing the design so much, but I do want to add in a lot of the features that I couldn't do for the original due to lack of disk space, memory, um, just time really. Hmm. Like I already extended the project probably about nine months, 10 months past its original sort of deadline. So Mindscape right. was patient with me. Um, so I, I, you know, but, you know, having a crunch schedule sometimes brings out the best because you end up taking, uh, you, you get innovative and sort of like, well, it has to be this, otherwise get rid of the whole thing. So sure. how can I do this feature without uh, uh, spending two months on it or something like that? Can I do it in a week? <laughs> so, uh, so, so some of that is like that. So the game will be sort of a tribute to the original. I've taken to heart some of the features I want. I'm still looking for the animation style. It will be not 3D. Uh, some people have asked, but, you know, I've worked on lots of 3D titles, and I don't think I could get the look and feel that Moonstone should have mm. without, like, you could, but it would require a massive team of, of really good technical 3D people to sort of pull together the cloth and the hair and sure. all, all that stuff. But um, so I, I'm sort of like relying on traditional 2D animation to, uh, to do it. And I, I think that's actually better because rigid skeletons and 3D and stuff are really great for a lot of reasons. But I think for Moonstone, I still want to sort of have that little bit of uh, traditional animation and the, the flexibility of a um, pencil or like, you know, a, a, an artist's interpretation to do the extra squash and squish. Like, there's a few people that, who was it? Um, Aaron Blaze is a, is a Disney animator that worked on The Lion King. And his comments when he saw the 3D version of The Lion King from John Favreau, he was not pleased. He did the original uh, character, some of the uh, main characters of The Lion King, and he was kind of discouraged at how static and everything he felt it looked compared to the hand-drawn nuances that he was able to bring and stuff. So maybe he's biased because he did the original. It's <laughs> like this Favreau is just like reinventing, you know, typical rebranding of stuff. So I'm trying to um, create something really good in that sense of the word. Um, uh, I've, I've described it as uh, maybe a living painting, maybe a, <laughs> that type of thing, but I, you know, that's too far, but. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't really have a, a, a date. I have started and stopped Moonstone remake about four times at this point. So I keep going back and forth. So it's uh, something I want to do. I certainly know it's well overdue to sort of pull it together. I think it was like 10 years ago. I was getting pinged by uh, a few fans saying, hey, can you, what, what's happening with this? Is there something I'd really love to play it? Some people have said, start a Kickstarter. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could maybe start a, a Kickstarter or something like that to get some funding and things. But uh, hmm. I'm not quite ready for that uh, uh, level of commitment. So hopefully, no, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, I might have something uh, to, to present on, on my Twitter or something like that. 
Okay, well, that's that's an idea, and I'm more than welcome to uh, present it on my Twitch streams as well, because uh, people have seen me die a multitude on uh, Twitch, on Moonstone, so I would love to do it all over again. Um, <laughs> I, I think, and I've said this before, um, there's two things I'm going to say. The first one is that I've always said that if you constrain yourself, whether it be time or technology or anything else, it really does breed creativity um by having a fixed boundary of of whatever you need to set um and i've seen it before i've seen games that go on and on and on and on and if they just put a hard line in and said this is it <laughs> you know yeah. we've got to get this out the door because the problem is is as uh, you know you know all too well as technology moves it moves at such a fast pace that by the time you think you're there something comes out which then re replaces that and you go crap i've now got to catch up to this level so then you've got to spend all that dev time catching up catching up catching up and by the time you get there then it's moved on again you go shit now i've got to carry on with everything else so i think there is a lot to be said about setting yourself boundaries but um one of in my opinion one of the best things to happen in modern if you want to class it modern retro gaming is the rebirth of side scrolling beat em ups yeah Things like things like Streets of Rage Four, the new Turtles game. Um, there are a multitude of side-scrolling beat 'em ups that have come out recently that are absolutely excellent two D beat 'em ups, but just really capture everything. And I remember when the Streets of Rage Four announcement came out, and everybody went, "Ah, oh, here we go! I bet it's going to be rubbish. They're not going to keep the style. It's going to look terrible. It's going to play terrible." This guy said that as well because. <laughs> it, it always makes you concerned that you're going to take something that people ultimately love and bring it into the new world. Is that transition going to work? And they did an absolutely brilliant job with it. There are still people who think that maybe the art style isn't uh, complementary of the previous, but I think there has to be a a push to the future, right? I mean, yeah, you can look at things with you know rose tinted goggles and and nostalgia goggles and say, oh, but it doesn't look like the original. It's no good. Well. Do you know what? You're talking to a whole new generation of people on a yeah. brand new platform. There's got to be some elements of, of new added to it. And I think the, I guess, comic stroke cell shaded effect that they kind of went through with, with Streets of Rage 4, just it really captured the the old and the new really nicely. It kind of brought it in brought it to life in like a, a comic book style. Um and I guess, you know, again, I don't know if that's the style that you're kind of going after, but it just shows that sometimes you have to you have to bite the bullet and say, do you know what? Throw the dart and say that is what it is and that's sticking. And another perfect example of this is uh, the new Monkey Island um, that's coming out. And it was it was horrific to see some of the comments that were coming back on Twitter where people were like, oh, this doesn't look like the original. Oh, I don't like this style. Man, man, man. It's why is it not 3D? And it's like, well, you can't cater for how many millions of people have played the old one because you're trying to reboot something into the modern day and if you keep doing the old you don't change anything for the future if that makes sense so i was i was very disappointed in a lot of people's feedback i think the game is going to do brilliantly well from a nostalgia point of view i think anyone who's ever seen heard touched smelt monkey island will definitely go and buy it but i really hope that with the the new art style it starts to bring new people to to point and click adventures and again that's probably another game genre that's massively had a a fire lit up under its butt side uh, but, buttocks recently which is the point and click adventure where loads of indie developers are making it but there it's funny because a lot of the indie developers are focusing majorly on pixel art um, graphics but there are some that have gone completely 180 and are doing these incredibly detailed 2d um sprites and and animations um one very interesting point and click adventure game if you've not played it is called chicken police and yeah. it's <laughs> it's it's hilarious it's all 2d r and yes as you can imagine you play as a chicken or a rooster that is a police officer but everyone else in the game is like an animal that's got a human body but it's done in such a brilliant Present presentation and it's so different but so cool at the same time oh, nice. so I, I kind of hope that with moonstone you you do keep some of that old but you don't get too put off by the new because do you know what there will be people who will say oh but it doesn't look like the original well it's not being the original it's a right. whole new take on it right yes. but here's something and I, and I kind of hope you do this because i've seen a couple of other games is to have a button where you can switch the graphics 
that would be amazing. <laughs> I have seen, uh, what was it, uh, the last Mario World had the, remember you could go to Retro 8-Bit and then back to the, yeah, no, that, I, I, I have had uh, someone actually say that if you do a re-release, could you have the original embedded into mm. the uh, the whole thing? And it's like, well, that, that would be pretty cool to do, so. I think but, one of the best, the best example I've seen of that in modern times actually was um another world it was the 20th anniversary one that they did where they kind of again similar thing they brought yeah. it to modern life you hit a button you go oh that's what it used to look like now i get it <laughs> yes i i saw your twitch i think of you playing another world just recently and i was like oh i remember that oh, i played that thing. that <laughs> game was so hard at some points it's just it seems so simple oh, yes and it's incredibly timed perfectly and uh, yeah some that's what i call one of those games you throw your joystick out of frustrated oh damn it <laughs> well, well well that is a very good question because there is a very important question that i've got on my list next to me which is what is your favorite amiga joystick very important question <laughs> it has to be the original atari 8 uh you know the the uh eight direction with one button that, that's the Good one choice. I use forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. It's just maybe something that I used as a kid, so it just sort of stuck with me. But um, that thing was uh, just awesome. Yeah, it's funny because I'm just looking up at my shelf here, and I've got like a collection of Ami specifically Amiga joysticks up here. And I've I, I look at it, and I've got like the um, Conic Speed King, which I still say is the best joystick of all time and people are going to go crazy in chat but i don't care um what else have i got there the cheetah bug which is about that big that you would no. hold like this and it's kind of got like an analog stick but you know what i liked micro switches why can't companies bring back more micro switch bloody control pads it was the best it was the <laughs> best i mean i've got an arcade stick here i think this has got hang on oh my gosh yeah, yeah. It's, it's got some micro switch, but I like the big loud clicky ones that you yes. used to get on the Amiga, a big stick and just clonk because you knew you were making connection there. And especially when you're playing a game like Moonstone, you need to make sure you've got that direction because if you don't, you're going to die. And this yes. guy died a lot. <laughs> I, I developed it all with the Atari joystick. That was wow. The, that I used that through, for, through the whole thing. So I, um, <laughs> I, I, for some reason, I never upgraded my joysticks at all. Um, so, yeah. I Bullet, Bulletproof joysticks through the years. Have you still got it, though? No, no. It's, ah, uh, damn. I, yeah, th that's one of my regrets is I don't have my Atari 2000 or Amiga 2000 anymore or the um, uh, all the discs that I used to have for Amiga. Oh, Although, wow. I, I don't they would work anymore after all these years uh, probably but one too many moves and keep down you know getting smaller and smaller places and stuff so uh, sure i, I was no, like I... yeah i don't have the original amiga that i developed anymore so I, and to be honest i think it got i donated it to the salvation army so to get rid wow. of it <laughs> well, hope, hopefully somebody's still got it. I'd be, I'd be devastated to learn if that thing's got into landfill or something like that. Yeah, Might but uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned about Amiga disc degrading because um, I had a friend of mine. He sent me a, um, a ton of discs. Um, one of which is, is quite comical, and I need to send it away, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, he sent me like cannon fodder, boxed, and a few other different games. I was hoping for Moonstone, but. <laughs> alas it wasn't there um and i went through and i pulled my a600 out and i was going through the disc and i was like that's dead that's dead oh that works that's good oh it loads halfway and dies went through that so it's just amazing how many discs are degrading but there was one disc and it's quite funny and you will laugh because all it says on it is sex partners and in brackets it says 18 now i can't get it to load and i'm very disappointed so i don't know if it was some random obscure game or whether it's a list of someone's conquests of women. I haven't discovered yet. We will find out at some point because I need to find out what's on that disc because it's it's been haunting me for ages. It's probably blank and someone's blanked it off. But yeah, it was just, as I was going through, I was like, 
what on <laughs> earth is this? And, like, and it was so funny because my stream, everyone in my chat was like, hey, put it in the A600. Let's see what's on it. And I'm like, well, I'm going to blank the screen off first and see if this thing loads. And it didn't. I was like, damn. Like It was like the only time I'd ever been torn where I wanted something to work and didn't at the same time. So, um, But yeah, this, this degradation is... Um, a sad thing to see and um also cassette tapes as well i mean cassette tapes in the uk for yeah. our 8-bit micros i mean they are degrading so quick but even for those um again a friend of the channel um neil from uh, rmc retro has done a brilliant job of taking his entire collection of um cassette tapes and mm. backing those up digitally um, and then he's got this crazy method where, for instance, on his Spectrums and some of the other 8-bit micros, has got like this device that plugs into like the headphone port and you push play and it kind of plays the digital audio through and goes into the system and still runs like normal. And I was like, what is this wizardry? <laughs> this is this is amazing. And this shouldn't work, but it does. Um, but yeah, it's it's sad to see these old things that we we loved so much. I mean, in fact, in that box up there, I've got a copy of, I think, monkey island 2 on four discs and, oh, wow. and i don't and i don't dare want to put them in the machine just in case it garbles it up but at the same time i'm like i don't want you to die but you will so i just i look at the outside cover like i still love you but i can't use these so it's fine <laughs> um but yeah. yeah i mean it's it's fascinating again as i said that the the old tech that we still hold on to has been given this i guess modern lease of life and and i really hope that you do find the the time and the the overall desire to, to finish this Moonstone remake, because, you know, even as a child, there are four or five games that stand out, but Moonstone will always stand out as being one of the most fun and hilarious games that I have ever played on the oh, Amiga, with, without question. It's brilliant. And I encourage anyone who owns an Amiga or hasn't played the game to, to go out there and, and somehow find a way to play it, because... It is just fantastic. Maybe not pay the five or eight hundred pounds that some people are offering, um, yeah. but I'm sure you can find a way to play it. Um, well, the, so, the PC versions on GOG or uh, oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, you, okay. you can get the PC version. Uh, the Amiga version, um, there's um, a legal issue with the who owns the Amiga OS nowadays. So there's uh, it's it's not possible to sort of just Put it out there so easy. sure but th that's unfortunate when i found that out because i was like oh can't we do that as well the amiga version has better sound and and stuff so and i i didn't code the pc version it was it was a port done by a couple guys that mindscape oh, okay yeah. and uh they, they did a pretty good job but pc being what it was you know um at that time it wasn't quite so well, there's so many configurations, it's difficult to program on a PC at the, in those days. So, yeah, Sound it, Blaster cards, EGA, CGA, VGA. I, it's so funny because I remember talking to someone not so long ago who I guess wasn't exposed to the Amiga or PC scene at, at that time period. And, and I said to him, I said, do you understand how difficult it was for PC game devs to go, okay, and which graphics are we going to use? <laughs> uh well which graphics cards in the machine i guess we're going with that one then and it was like yeah but there's like 15 other different versions you could pick from that are not compatible with each other yes. god damn it people can we just unite on one thing <laughs> yes no i'm i i will say this uh the evolution of computers to where we are today indie developers have so many great things resolve that they don't have to even think about anymore i like, agree like if just to get art out of an art package back in the day you sort of had to know the file format you had to reverse engineer the file format to get into your file format and now today it's just all standardized it's it's so nice just to <laughs> not have to think about any of that it's i'll tell i'll tell you something funny literally the other day i, I what was i doing Oh, that was it. I, I wanted to convert um, or rip the audio out of a video that I was using for, for actually another podcast. And I could have opened Premiere and I could have just put the video in and exported as an MP3. I was so lazy that I opened a web browser and said MP4 to M MPEG3, uh, to MP3, hit return. I went, 
oh, there seems to be a website. Upload, click, download. Right, done. And I was like, <laughs> and then I sat there and went, Christ, hang on a minute. How long would this have taken someone like 10, 15 years ago? And I was like, I've just done this in about 30 seconds. That's really yeah. scary because it literally would have taken me more time to literally open up a whole new Premiere uh, project and drag this thing in and then set everything. And I was just like, duh, duh, duh. right, okay. Oh, good. The web does everything again that's easy. It's so <laughs> nice today. Like in, in game engines too, Unity and Unreal are just available to you and they do so much of your work that you can just dive right into, I'm just going to start doing my design in the game. I don't have to sure. think about all these pipelines and stuff. And I, I'm working with 3D now too. And it's like, even that's all being standardized to a, a large extent uh, before. I just remember uh, a gray matter when we would have to do uh, these intense pipelines and reverse engineer Maya or alias at the time, alias wavefront and soft image. And, mm. and there's these guys that just look at file formats and try and dissect where the polygons are stored and how do you get them and how do you get the texture in front? And it's like, now it's like, Oh, it's all there for you. So it's, indie developers, you, know what? you, you have a nice road ahead of you to just be able to say, I have a great game idea and you can just go for it. So it's true. And I think that's a beautiful thing that, yeah. um, to make a game now has never been easier. But again, there is that hint, as I said before, and I, I've said this before actually on my last podcast about video making, where to make a decent video now is very easy because most mobile phones are 4K, so you've got that sorted. Most microphones, you could go on Amazon and buy a relatively cheap lapel mic that will do a perfectly good job for like 20, 30 pounds. So you've already got the video and the audio sorted, all yeah. you need is the creativity. And the problem is, is because there's no boundaries, people just, they, 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 they don't, they don't focus the energy into one area. And I think you mentioned a very good point because I came from an animation background and I've, I've used Maya or Maya, however you want to pronounce it before. And during my course, it was, you know, teaching you how to build a skeleton and then, you know, rigging that skeleton to a model and then doing all the textures and getting all the, <laughs> all the mapping correctly. And, you know, if you want to do hair, forget it because the PC isn't powerful enough to render it. Right. So you sit there and you go, how easy is it now? And I did this the other day. I said, how easy is it for me to start from scratch, get a character and animate it? And I was shocked at how simple it is to there's so many packages out there yeah um i used to use one a long time ago i think it was called was it poser 3d i think it was called um yeah. so, you, so you could build a model for instance externally bring that into this piece of software and it would literally just snap all the body parts together and to make like a running scene would literally go make this character run click okay i'm running now cool that's an animation done and then you know how much do you want the person's gait to, to run offset or something like that so you know if someone had been shot you could offset their gait so they run a bit different and i thought this would have taken me like a whole university module to do and i've just done this in 10 minutes i'm like it shouldn't it shouldn't be this easy but it's cool that it is <laughs> it, it is i i'm i love the amount well the internet in that regard is so much great reference material so much like what you said just like oh i can just piece this together someone's already posted free motion capture and i can just import it into this thing and look i can just rent i'm like wow this is just so wonderful so i think the other uh, the, the other useful thing is that um when it comes to things like um, problem solving and troubleshooting, as you said, you had to rely on friends or friends of friends or friends who worked in the building that you happen to be in. Whereas now you can just go, why doesn't this work in Unreal Engine? I don't get it. Stack, Click. Oh, that's stack it. Overflow. Done. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> How does this work? Da, 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 da. Right, that's it. Done. Yeah. So, what, Whatever yeah. problem I have, someone else has had it and probably written it up on the internet somewhere. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's kind of a fun fun time i i find for development of these days so yeah so so moving on from from moonstone into more of your i guess modern modern day uh game making and design was there was there lots of things that you had learned in your i guess previous time making games that were very useful into making modern games in terms of your knowledge and and f processes and stuff was there much that you brought over from i guess to quote a term old game making versus new game making yeah it um i definitely can say that 
because of the old days, teens were small and you wore many hats. So you got exposed to the programming, the art, the management, the, you know, sales, you meet the publishers and stuff. Today's world, most, most of the people bring in, in today's teams, you know, are very sort of like task centric, you know, here's your tasks and here's your thing. And, and there's not a lot of, um, they basically have little, uh, you know, like, uh, development directors that sort of go between the different people to sort of orchestrate. So you're not like involved with all those things. So I think for me, it's just, I, I can relate. I can say, Oh, I've walked in the shoes of the animator. I've walked in the shoes of the designer. I've done the testing. I've done the publishing part. I've done production management. So I've, I've sort of done all these different pieces. And so that's, I think it advantageous for me because, um, uh, I can relate to a lot of the people that I work with and what their jobs are and stuff. Um, like the hardest thing for me was when I went from uh, hands-on development, programming and art to producing when I was actually the producer and in charge of the team, because it's, it's a different discipline where you're then now sort of delegating other people to do tasks. And all that you can do is say, this is what I want. But for me, because I had done the programming and stuff, I can relate to uh, what those people are going to have to do <laughs> and how hard it can be. Or the, uh, you know, I used to always say, it's like, uh, my old joke was, uh, we would just used to say, take two weeks to do this task. That was the go-to thing, two weeks. <laughs> and then, and then a week later, it's like, how long is that task? In? Two weeks. It's always two weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think there was a line in that uh, movie uh, Snatch uh, with um, when Turkish was asking yeah. when the when the sausages are going to be done. Yeah, five that's minutes. exactly what I was thinking. That's yeah, exactly what minutes, I was thinking. Five minutes. And it's like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I laughed when I saw that. I said, I think we've I've used that line before. So that was quite funny. So, <laughs> so Guy Ritchie, I guess, has probably written that or some whoever his writers were at the time but um so yeah i think i i uh sort of bring some some things forth but the biggest thing is because i've done design i i think when i've done programming and other companies and stuff like that i, I think i i've been helpful in the sense of um being able to relate and say i i i sort of see what you're going for and so i can sort of like keep keep up with it it's not like could you write me a full design and tech spec and implementation and stuff i'm like okay i get what you're saying so like what one of the producers at uh ea when i worked at electronic arts he he, he liked me a lot because he says you don't seem to ever argue <laughs> about <laughs> what i'm what i'm trying to get and so but I, I sort of see you know we're all trying to achieve the same goal i'm not trying to defeat you here or something like yeah, that it's, cool. it's like you know we want a great game and it's all good and i want to make sure that you're happy i want you to be happy you know that type of thing so it's kind of a uh you know we all we're all on the same mission here hmm. um except when i have to work like you know without sleep that that's <laughs> i get a, that get a little tired at a certain point so no, but, I'm sure. And um, that's a very good point you've raised, because I think if you go into any project, and it can be any project, if there is a um, an opinion of where the direction is going that isn't the same as everybody else, it completely derails it, because you suddenly go, well, why are they saying that? Is there something that's wrong with the project? Because, as you said, you know, it may be not having resistance, but unless everybody's pulling in the same direction and having that same vision and everybody's got the same goal, by having that internal conflict can completely derail a project, yeah. completely derail it. Yeah, it can, I, I've certainly been on, on some projects where the team starts getting divided and it starts getting more and more difficult to sort of like move forward because there's too much debate about what... And, and I get upset sometimes with management because management's job is to make the definitive choice and have everyone move forward. And it's, sure. and I find some management don't do that and they think it's healthy to have this free for all and sort of pit, <laughs> pit the two sides of the team against each other. And I'm like, no, that's not good. So what, what I, like find, what's that? <laughs> I 
much well, like Moonstone, just put them head to head and cut each other's head off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Moonstone, I had the luxury of I was the the guy. I was the programmer, the artist, and I was on the design. So uh, I would argue with myself, maybe, but. <laughs> but there were some times uh, I think, yeah, it would have been helpful maybe to have someone just say, just get this done. Well, Mindscape did eventually say, we have to release this. So fly out to England and get this done. So, uh, but uh, on the other th- side of things, um, yeah, the, the divided team is starts getting kind of tough. But my approach to design and I certain Japanese companies tended to try and like lock in a certain design at the beginning before anything's written. And I'm like, you can't do that because you don't know if it will work as much as, as much research as you have done and saying, Oh, it's a bit of this game. It's a bit of this game. And a bit of... yeah, but you don't know if all those games melded together with this team is going to be good. And so it's kind of, um, what, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mark Cerny, I believe who was, um, uh, one of Sony's big guys, Crash Bandicoot guy. But uh, he came to work with EA for a little bit, and I got to interact with him a bit. But, yeah, he he was sort of like – and uh, who was the other guy? Uh, the guy of Shiny Entertainment. Um, uh, anyways, uh, anyways, uh, those guys were just like, what's the hook? Like, y- you got to have that hook, as they say, or even in Hollywood stories. It's like, what's the hook of this thing? Why do I want to play it? What? Why? What's interesting about this? So they would say, you got to develop that first, get people excited about that, and then you can build out from that. And uh, Cerny was all about that particular. He would create the sandbox level that's going to emphasize all the hooks and where you can do it. And, and, and Shiny Entertainment... Uh, one of my favorite games with Earth was Earthworm Jim, which was a classic platformer. Fantastic animation, but yeah, the hook was the the, the worm being able to use his head as a <laughs> as a whip, as a whip. And, whip yeah. <laughs> and grab things and lunge everywhere. And so I was like, yeah. So that was their hook. It was like this is the hook of the characters, and then they build out from that feature. And uh, I think sometimes um, certain game development studios get too locked in on a certain thing and it's not working. Then they start to panic and they start throwing more people at it, thinking that will solve it. And that, that makes things worse because now you got new ideas and it's just like all divided at that point. So um, it's, it's a tough one. Like I've certainly worked with amateur or amateurs. <laughs> I won't say amateurs. I'll, I'll say rookie producers that have never done it. They've, you know, sort of being promoted up the ranks from uh, maybe test or maybe they just came from another industry altogether. And um, they sort of come in with these ideas, but they don't really know what to do. And they don't know how to talk to tech people because tech people tend to be very uh, detailed about what they're doing. And it just throws off because producer is more like this is the big picture and this guy's saying i'm just talking about this one small thing (laughs) so anyways yeah so i think that's what i sort of move forward with in in some of the things i i sort of get it get what they're asking and sort of like they're not looking for a great detailed argument or something like that they're sort of like can you do this because i think this is uh what it would, would would be good but sometimes you know you do get these odd questions where it's like I'm not sure why you want to do that. <laughs> That's, it's like, you know, you're, you're playing this uh, uh, sort of like certain type of game. And then they say, I played this other game the other night and I think it's great. And we should bring in the, and it's like, what, wait, no, that's a different game entirely. Why are you, why are you thinking that I get it? You like it. It's a good game, but no, it doesn't work with this. So sure. I think my, my favorite thing was um, my favorite statement from a producer at EA was, I was working on triple play baseball and they said, we need to make a baseball game that will appeal to people that don't like baseball. And I was just like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So please explain <laughs> what you have in mind here. So, but they were trying to obviously increase sales, expand sure. and stuff. And, and I get what they're saying. They, they tapped out on their audience. Uh, but, uh, so we ended up doing the home run derby thing, thinking that that would 
be an exciting thing for non-baseball fans to do. I don't know if it did anything or not. But, <laughs> but okay, I was going to well, ask, did it work or not? But I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, sometimes you, you sort of encounter, and you know it's sales-driven rather than sort of design-driven. It's like, hey, we want to increase sales, make shareholders happy and stuff like that. So sure. but my job is to make a good game. So. <laughs> Well, you certainly did with Moonstone. Um, I, I get, the last thing I, I normally ask guests is, and this is going to be an interesting one for you, what's been your proudest moment in all of your gaming creation history? Um, proudest Doesn't have moment. to be Moonstone. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely Moonstone. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like asking what's your favorite David Bowie song. And it's like, well... <laughs> Well, there's so many generations of David Bowie. It's like he trans. It's hard to pick one, but I, I would have to say because Moonstone was sort of like uh, uh, a work of passion and love for for that game, and it was a culmination of uh, playing D and D with my friends and just sort of like an independent thing. So it wasn't like so. Yeah, I would have to say that, and I think it was sort of sticking to classical animation styles and stuff that, so it's kind of in that, in that world, I've certainly done other things I'm very happy with and proud of. Um, but, uh, that, that's the crown right there. So, no, so well, I think, I, when I do Moonstone 2, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I want to make sure that I don't spoil it. <laughs> no, it, well, I, again, you've touched on a very good point where I think there are, there are chances where if you don't get things correct and you start to stray maybe too far from the source, um, you, you can line yourself up for that, I guess, nostalgia kill where people are like, well, it's not like the original and now I hate the original. It's like, well, the original's still good. <laughs> the original's still good. We, we can remember that. Um, yeah. But, I mean, in, in closing, I think... Um, I don't think your name gets mentioned enough for the contribution that you and your your co-creator made with Moonstone. It is one of the the standout examples of what the Amiga can produce with a joystick and a button being one of the best enjoyments that you can have. With modern gaming, you've got this control pad, this behemoth that has got a thousand and one different buttons on it that all do certain things. But when you bottle Moonstone down, a Moonstone down to it, it's 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 a it's a, a joystick and a button right and the rest is yeah. made up in, in the game and with that alone it's why it stands out in my mind the attention to detail with the animation the story the the creativity with some of the elements that you add into there as well as the storytelling and each each time you play it something different happens and and right. that gives you a perfect reason to go back and play a game there are too many examples in modern day gaming where you pay especially now, 40, 50, 60 pounds for a game. Yeah. And when it's done, it's done. But games like Moonstone, and there are a plethora of games, great games on the Amiga, where it doesn't matter how many times you play them or how many times you die in them, um, you always go back to replay them because it's those little fine touches of having a different experience of every single gameplay that make it brilliant. And and for me and probably the rest of the Amiga community, you know, it's you've done a fantastic job. And um, oh, I can you. say I can see the poster behind you on the wall, and I want one. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, you know, Moonstone will always, always have a place in my heart. And whenever you make this this remaster, remake, whatever you want to call it, I'm I'm absolutely certain it will be a success. And I really hope that for the the lack of exposure that it got worldwide, that the remake is the thing that finally pushes it out to the masses and people finally get to experience it all because it, it massively deserves more attention than it's currently got. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's very kind to say. I pre I'm, I'm happy that it found the audience, be it over time or not. Like, I, I'm just thrilled that uh, I've received letters and sort of like, like yourself, from people like just saying, Hey, I, I love this game. It's like being from Brazil, South America, throughout Europe, Turkey, Asia, and uh, even some Canada, US, not so much, but <laughs> ironically, well, we I live need, in the, we need to in change the US. That. We need to change. We need to change that. We need to get it more into the US market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's right. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, but I, I know the roots of the game is primarily England and, and Europe. It's like, uh, I, I think, uh, but, uh, you know, although a lot of people are totally into these, uh, like, Lord of the Rings and stuff, so here, mm. so definitely, yeah, it's uh, it's got an audience just untapped yet. Yeah, I agree. I mean, D&D has had a huge resurgence, especially in the last, I would say, the last three years. In fact, I actually have a funny feeling that um, the pandemic that happened actually helped fuel a resurgence in D&D playing over the internet. So mm. now I'm seeing loads of people streaming their D&D uh, uh, sessions. I'm seeing loads of people doing it digitally in calls similar to what we're doing now. I'm seeing people meet up. It's it's crazy how it has completely reignited that. And I think if you time this right and you market it right, you could massively tap into that. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we're going to see Moonstone, the D&D kit. Or, oh, my gosh. You know, that, would some, be, some, that would be amazing. Some, <laughs> some figures and stuff like that well you know th stranger things have happened right and uh, mm -hmm. i think that the sky is the limit with this type of thing and you know moonstone has always been always been something that's fascinated me because of the lore the story and as i said the unpredictability of knowing what you're going to face next and you know I, I see massive scope in it and i'm i'm so happy to hear that you're working on a, a further development on moonstone so um if people aren't already excited they bloody well should be because i am i'm like a little kid here going just give me it now just give it to me Rob. just give it to me but um you know maybe i'll do another stream of it on twitch in the near future and uh and relive those old days but in closing thank you so much rob it's been mind-blowing in some of the things that you've told me it's been a massive exposure to um to the industry the impact that you've had and uh, again I, I thank you so much for your time one thing i would like you to put in the game is all of the drawings that you've done if there's like a gallery section that you could flick through where people can see how the artwork was made and i think that would be a really nice touch it's it's a nice thing and i th i think um i think the turrican anthology they didn't include anything like that and i was like <laughs> why <laughs> you've got an anthology put this stuff in because sometimes it's nice i know albeit digitally it's nice to just see oh where yeah. things have started from because people just go oh well it's a bunch of sprites you throw them on the screen and off they go but if they can see that that historical build up um you know you may want to watermark them as much as you want but just mm -hmm. seeing those those pieces of art digitally and, and having a full understanding of where it's come from, I think just enables people to have a lot more respect for it as, as I do. And many other oh, people yeah. do. I, I, I will. That's, that's actually a great idea because I, I did send Rob Taylor for all his work. I sent him some of my original, uh, one of my paintings and uh, several of the animation cells to him. So he's, he's put them up on his wall there. So. There you go. You better go and call him back now because you're going to have to go and put it in your remake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I scanned him already, so he, he can uh, Good keep job. Them. Good yeah. job. Good job. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you so, so much, Rob. Um, for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about Rob or send him a tweet saying, hello, thank you for making Moonstone, uh, all of his details will be below in the show notes or in or whatever your whatever platform you're using. If it's on Spotify or any other of those platforms, it will be there. On YouTube, it will be probably in one of the top pinned comments. But anyway, from me, me, Machine Dean, and from Rob, thank you so much, Rob. You can wave if you want. There we go. He did it. He did it. I didn't have to tell him. That's brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Rob. It's been All brilliant. Right, Machine Dean, signing All out. Right. Take care, everyone. Hi there, Dean here. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Make sure you add this podcast to your favourites on whichever podcasting platform you use and give it a positive review. Until next time, me, Machine Dean, signing out.